Let's get started. First, I just want to mention uh, the student evaluation of teaching and units, or whatever that acronym stands for, uh, is online now, and it will be for a couple more weeks. So you can access this through Moodle. There's a little link there that you'll click through on the Moodle homepage. Um, I you know, try to take seriously the qualitative feedback that I get from you folks. So the quantitative feedback sort of all just gets digested and ends up as numbers on a page. but um, if you have like concrete comments about what you liked and what you struggled with and what you'd change, it's always useful to get that. So, uh, and from the faculty's point of view, they wanted to incentivize you by me telling you that you get in the draw for gift vouchers. So anyway, look, I'm not supposed to say this, but personally I'm not too fussed one way or the other whether you do the, um, the feedback, but I just want to assure you that if you do do it, I will read the feedback. It all gets anonymized, so I don't know where it's from, but it's useful for me, so I can think about how I might do things differently in future versions of the unit. Uh, you're probably all eager to find out more about the exam. I did put some, um, some information up on Moodle for this yesterday, so you can go and have a look at that. I'll go over the details of that in next week's lecture. All right, so today we're talking about a problem that goes by different names depending on who's talking about it, but for our purposes we'll call it the problem of partiality. Essentially it's the problem of how you can live an ethical life while still caring about some people more than others, as obviously all of us do because we have special relationships with friends and family members. So we'll try to cash out the problem in a bit of detail, look at things that deontologists and consequentialists have said in response to try to salvage their ethical theories in the face of this problem, and then finish by looking at this Susan Wolf paper on moral saints, which hopefully some of you have had a read of, which uh, makes the somewhat dramatic response to these kinds of problems of saying maybe other kinds of reasons override ethical reasons, and ethics is not this kind of sovereign domain of reasons. Okay, so just to start off by clarifying a piece of terminology, this word partial. Sometimes I think people encounter this word and habitually want to read it uh, in a way that's kind of misleading. When you talk about partial reasons, you think what we're talking about are incomplete reasons, reasons that encompass part but not the entirety of the reasons that we have. So that's actually not how the word gets used in this discourse. When we speak of partial reasons, we're using the word partial in the sense that's the opposite of impartial. So an impartial person is someone who shows no favoritism towards anyone. So a person who is partial is someone who does show favoritism towards particular people. And then when we speak of partial reasons, we're speaking of the kinds of reasons that are manifested when we act in ways that show favoritism or priority to the people that we care about. Now I'm going to do a few little thought experiment type things. Uh, what I want you to do before we get started is think about the person in the world that you love the most. So this could be a parent uh, or a sibling. Uh, or a blogger whose work is just so brilliant that it obsesses you during the lecture and you uh, can't pay attention to what the lecturer is saying. Or probably for many of you it will be a, a boyfriend or girlfriend or uh, maybe a best friend. So I want you to get that person into your head. And um, you know, it might be slightly embarrassing if you feel like you have to rank your friends or family members, but just I'm not going to tell you to like, you're not going to have to disclose to the person you're talking to um, you know, who your favorite was, but just get it in your head, the person that you love the most. Okay, has everyone got in their head the person that they love the most? Yeah? You up the back there, do you have in your head the person who you love the most? Excellent, and you in that back corner? Genius, okay. So now let's do the example. Imagine that two people are drowning, uh, you know, you're on a yacht, the yacht's been buffeted by waves and two people have fallen overboard, one of them is the person that you love the most, and the other one is a random stranger and you have a life ring. And you know, look, maybe the person who doesn't get the life ring, maybe it'll all work out, maybe there's a rescue boat about to come around the corner to fix everything, but you don't know any of that. You've just got a life ring here and you could throw it to the person that you love or to the random stranger. So I want you to think about it for 10 seconds and then I'm going to ask you who you throw it to, A or B. Okay, thinking caps on.
Okay, so, oh, is this a question or a, a clarification? An answer. Oh, an answer? Yeah, I would split the life jacket into two. <laughs> so this is a magical life jacket that's incapable of being chopped in half. It's, uh, it's made of unobtainium or something that can't be sliced. <laughs> so who's going to choose to throw the life, racket, uh, life jacket to the stranger? And who's going to choose to throw the life jacket to the person they love? Good. You're all ethically decent people. You all care more about your most loved person than randoms. Okay. So let's give a slightly more complicated version of the example. Suppose now it's not individuals, there's people in life rafts and you're driving the rescue boat and you can drag one life raft back to the shore, it will take you about half an hour to circle back around to pick up the next one and in the meantime you know the waves are churning and the boat's pretty flimsy and it could easily be sunk. So again, everyone might work out fine in the end but you're not in a position to know that, you're going to have to make a choice about which life raft you prioritise. In life raft A there are 20 people and you don't know any of them in life raft B, you do a quick head count, 19 people, oh hang on, that's my wife, or that's my father, or my child whom I love. Okay, so there's 19 people in the second raft and one of them is the person in the world that you love the most. So, hi. <laughs> uh, the, the, the question is, A, who wants to save the 20 people they don't know, and B, who wants to save the 19 where there's one person who they love? So who's going to save the 20 people they don't know? A couple of consistent utilitarians or consequentialists in the audience and who's going to save the life raft with one fewer people but someone they love. Okay, pretty strong favouritism for the second view. Uh, okay, keep your hand up in the air if you chose B. So there's only five or six of you who chose A. Right up in the air if you chose B. Okay, so I just want to know, do you take your hand down if I change the number so that now instead of 19 people there's 15 people? Who's, who's not going to save the... F okay, so now, now let's sort of see when people's hands go down. So what about if it was saving three people? 20 strangers or three people and one of them is your most loved person. I'm seeing some faces of agony like... Because the question you're asking is, how many strangers am I prepared to kill in order to save my you know, mother or father or sister or boyfriend or whatever? Is anyone prepared to go all the way and say, yeah, I'd do a 20 to 1 swap? I mean, I think there's a kind of honesty in that response. Like, seriously, if you weren't having to perform your moral choices publicly, like if this was all just secret and private, if, if I'd never had to see them again, if I didn't know who, know who they were, 20 people for the life of the person I care most about, it's pretty, it's, it's like, it's, you have to have a pretty principled kind of ethical sensibility in order to just let someone you love die just because the sums don't come out favourably. Okay, so people who've been thinking about this problem uh, in the ethical kind of literature over the years have tried to soften the blow of the tension that this problem generates for us. The tension that the problem generates is all ethical theories, not just consequentialist ones, all ethical theories assume that we're going to take an impartial point of view. None of us, as a matter of fact in our lives, are in the habit of taking an impartial point of view, how do we reconcile that reality about the kinds of beings we are with the platitudinous fact that ethical theories require us to be impartial? So, some people have gone the whole hog and said that our regular ethical thinking, our inclination to show partiality towards the people we love, that's just got to go. William Godwin was a man who thought that that was one of many things that had to go. He was a radical anarchist, so he was, and also a, a hardline utilitarian, so he was in favour of overturning lots and lots of conventional social and political mores, and included amongst them was the idea that we should be able to show partiality towards our nearest and dearest. So that's the kind of the view that's up one radical end of the spectrum. Um, a much more, uh, you know, palatable view. Uh, it's from this guy Charles Freed, who was the Solicitor General uh, under Reagan, or if not Reagan, under one of the US presidents. Um, his view was that partiality is okay in certain situations, but that many of us occupy positions of social responsibility which require uh, that we behave impartially and where we make some sort of tacit or maybe explicit commitment to others to conduct ourselves in that way. So, you know, even those of you who think, yeah, it's perfectly justified for you to let 
five random strangers die in order to save the person you like, would probably be dramatically pissed off if it turned out that someone in this course was my cousin and I was just giving them 95 for everything, right? And you say, why are you doing that? It's like, well, you know, we all agree we're allowed to show partiality. You've got to say, no, hang on, it's not like that. There are all sorts of social contexts in which we make commitments to each other to be fair-minded and impartial. So what someone like Charles Fried would say is a whole host of our ethical choices are governed by this kind of commitment to be impartial. And in the space that's left over after that, right, we have an entitlement to show some partiality. So those instincts towards impartiality do govern many of our choices, but not all of them. Now, right down the far end of the spectrum uh, in favour of partiality is Bernard Williams, our old mate from earlier in the semester. Williams has this really interesting view. He thinks, look, in a case where it's save the stranger or save the person I love, or in all sorts of everyday scenarios in which we're deciding whether to show favouritism or somehow be objective and impartial, it's not just the case that we're permitted to show partiality. We are permitted to show partiality, but more than that, the way that we should manifest our partiality shouldn't even um, hinge on us taking a kind of a reflective patient moment to think conscientiously about, am I ethically justified in demonstrating partiality in this particular case? Yes, I think I am. Okay, now I'll be partial. He says, no, if your child is drowning, you should not even think through the ethical scenario in that way before just diving in to save them or throwing them the raft, right? Uh, throwing them the, the life jacket. He thought that if you contemplate your decision in that sort of detached ethical mindset, that is to use his famous phrase, one thought too many. So it's not just that we're justified in demonstrating partiality. To, to demonstrate the kind of the, the sort of partiality that's appropriate, we have to not even enter into this reflective ethical mindset in demonstrating it. I'll give an example in a couple of slides that sort of teases out this thought. So there's three kinds of responses to the issue. The, the work that's delved deepest into this issue has been work that's trying to understand how friendship and love works, right? And the example that I gave starting out of asking you to think about the person you love the most was not just a random choice. That's actually, for people working on this topic in the, in the sort of cutting edge research, that's where the action is. That's how we understand these questions about partiality properly, by thinking about how love works, how friendship works. So the article by Stocker is kind of on this. Um, before talking about Stocker, I'm just going to skip through that slide because I want to get to this. Um, before talking about Stocker, there's just this lovely quote from the English novelist E.M. Uh, e. Forster, which uh, it's nice to quote in this context. He says, if I had to choose between betraying my country and betraying my friend, I, sh I hope I should have the guts to betray my country. I think what's nice about this uh, this way of putting it is that it, I think it picks up on a thought that many of us uh, on reflection would agree with, that actually being a good friend is more important than being a good patriot, right? Ethically speaking, I mean, maybe there are some reasons in favour of nationalism or patriotism, but who do I ethically admire more? The person who's a steadfast friend and family member or the rah-rah patriot? The friend. And yet despite that pretty, you know, widely shared judgement, it sounds like he's saying something quite subversive here. I hope I should have the guts to betray my country rather than my friend. What he's trying to tease out is this thought that it's implicit in the ideals of friendship and love that most of us already subscribe to, that actually we should be prepared to go against the interests of the larger group or some larger abstract ideal, as the case may be, in order to prioritise the people we really care about. So the article from Stocker is in some ways revolving around this, this kind of thought. Um, here's a, a quotation from the article that, to my mind, really hits some kind of a nail on the head. He says, Love, friendship, affection, fellow feeling and community all require that the other person be an essential part of what is valued. The person, not merely the person qua producer or possessor of general values, must be valued. And what's he saying here? He's trying to challenge the consequentialist and the deontologist at the same time, saying, yeah, consequentialists, I know that you value people, but you value people in a way that 
makes their specificity and individuality irrelevant. Right? I value this guy because that's where happiness and flourishing lives. It lives inside this organism over here. So I'm going to prioritize him in certain cases or look after him. But why do I care about him? Because I care about happiness or flourishing. And he's just a kind of uh, a source of extrinsic reasons. And the source of intrinsic reasons is the flourishing. And say, so, OK, maybe that's just a problem for consequentialism because isn't deontology going to do better on this front? Deontology is more built around this idea of respecting people um, you know, for their own sake. But even there, Stockelware is going to want to say, yeah, but the way in which that respect is kind of grounded takes the person out of the picture in a similar, pro similarly problematic way. Because why do you care about the person if you're a Kantian? You care about the person because you have these highfalutin ideas about rationality and the way that rationality generates certain kinds of binding duties. Right? So the person enters into your consideration because of the way that rationality generates certain demands, but the person themselves as a kind of an end, as a, as a fundamental source of value, gets lost. Now, of course, the consequentialist and the deontologist are going to have something to say in response to this, so we'll get to that in a minute. But hopefully you get the, the gist of the worry. Right? And it's not, supposed to be, um, it's not supposed to be this kind of alien thought that... Um, you know, all of you people who are doing conventional ethics, you're just like, you're not tapped into the right sort of values. He's trying to say, no, you are tapped into the right sort of values. Look at the way you live your lives. Look at the way you do prioritize your friends and your loved ones. The problem is that your ethical theory isn't appropriately conditioned by the values that you're already tapped into in the way that you live. So let's, now I'm going to give you a kind of corny example that sort of brings us out. I really hope the sound effects work. So this is, uh, a, you know, let's imagine that the, the lady is sick and the guy is, uh, you know, her partner or something and he's brought her flowers to comfort her when she's sick. And he says, oh no, the sound effects didn't work. Hang on, I'm going to do that again. It's because I had it muted. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Wait. <okay. laughs> Darling, I brought you flowers because it's right to try to maximize human happiness and you would have been quite unhappy if I didn't bring any flowers, right? So here are the flowers. I did good, yes? <laughs> like, no, that's not what I want to hear. I want to hear that you love me, that you care about me, right? You're giving me the wrong sort of reasons. Maybe the action is a good one, but it's not stemming from the right sort of emotional, ethical sensibility given the kind of relationship that we have. I don't want to merely be a consequence of your kind of ethical algorithm, or I don't want your affection to me to be a consequence of your ethical algorithm. I want to be the source of your reasons. Or, so we've picked on the consequentialist, let's pick, some, pick on the deontologist. <laughs> Darling, I brought you flowers because I found that I couldn't rationally universalize any maxim on which I didn't bring you flowers. Aren't I an ethically impressive husband and human being? <laughs> no. <laughs> Get out. I'm, I'm sick of this conversation. Right? So this is I mean, it's kind of a trite way of making the point, but this is, this is what Stocker's worried about. He's worried that we violate the, the kinds of commitments and the kinds of, I don't know, relational textures that by acquaintance we all know about and we all care about when we subscribe to ethical theories that cash out our reasons for right action in these you know, abstracted terms that don't put relationships at the center of it. Okay. So, how does this play out then? What do the standard ethical theories get us to? We, we can sort of see intuitively why Stocker thinks they're inadequate. Where do they lead us? Well, they end up giving us a choice. So one horn of the dilemma is what uh, Stocker calls schizophrenia. And um, probably if he was writing the article again today, he wouldn't use that term because, you know, I think people now are a little bit more sensitive to the way that using schizophrenia to mean something bad has a kind of stigmatizing effect on the mentally ill. But you get the idea that he's gesturing towards. You could call it double-mindedness or um, sort of duality. There's something in the mindset of the person who subscribes to an ethical theory, any, any sort of, of the ethical theories that we've looked at up until this point in the course, that abstracts away from the particulars of our lives. A person who subscribes to that ethical theory but carries on having the sorts of relationships that we all want to have 
is going to end up with a duality or a double-mindedness or a schizophrenia, right? Um, because their motivations day to day will be soaked with these ideas about relational partiality as they are for all of us. And yet, in the cool reflective moment, the story that they tell about what justifies them in making the choices that they do make is going to erase all of that stuff from, you know, from the rationalization. There's going to be a, a really sort of profound disjunct between what actually makes them tick day to day and the story that they have to tell about what rationalizes and justifies their choices. Okay, so that doesn't seem very good. What's the alternative? Well, the alternative is a kind of unhappiness that comes from actually letting our abstracted ethical theories set the agenda and become the determining source of our motivations and passions and inclinations. Right? Why that leads to unhappiness is because if we actually lived the way that consequentialism or Kantian deontology or any of their sub-varieties tell us, we would end up forfeiting the kind of, as I say here, ardent commitments that are involved in genuine friendship, genuine love, etc. Now, it's easy to, um, having got the, the gist of the, the problem that Stock is trying to articulate, it's easy to then misunderstand what he's trying to say about this. So let me be clear, Stocker isn't of the view that we should always exhibit partiality or total partiality in all of our choices, right? He doesn't think that being kind of grotesquely nepotistic, right, or let me put it in terms that um, maybe make us a little bit more uneasy, being like sexist and racist and homophobic, or reverse racist and reverse sexist and reverse homophobic. He doesn't think that that's the way to live our lives, being prejudicial and discriminatory and having favoritisms left, right and center. He just thinks that there is some region of our lives where one way or the other, that is going to be what goes on, right? So think about it, you know, I mean, the most obvious example is who you fall in love with, right? You can't be expected to fall in love with other people in a way that subscribes to some ideal of fairness. That's just not what love is about. It's about prioritizing in a way that, you know, from the abstract point of view, is completely unfair. What, you're going to devote your whole life to this one person? You know, imagine someone saying, that's not a very fair way to spread your affection around. The response is going to be, I don't think you understand what love is about, right? So Stocker's, Stocker's not saying that all of life gets to be decided by these kinds of favoritisms. He's saying that some important parts of life are like that. And if we subscribe to ethical theories that are um, you know, impartial in this complete and thoroughgoing way, we're going to become alienated from those parts of life that are you know, among the very best parts of life. Okay, does this all make sense? We can understand what, why Stock is so wound up about ethical theories? Good. Okay, so let's see what the standard uh, kind of ethical views have to say in response to this. So the deontologist, I think, at the end of the day has a somewhat easier time trying to recuperate their theory in the face of this worry. The first point they're going to say is, look, deontology by its nature doesn't colonize and invade every corner of your life. We're not like consequentialists who think that every single decision has to be regulated by this maximizing or optimizing ideal. We think that there are duties and prohibitions and obligations, so you have to satisfy your duties. You can't act in ways that violate any of the prohibitions. But having satisfied your duties and, violate, uh, and foregone any um, prohibited acts, there's some space that's left over, right? There is some discretionary room for choice and decision making in which you can express partiality, right? In fact, the news is arguably even slightly better than that. For instance, Kantians tend to really like promises and contracts. They think that having made a promise or some kind of agreement, you can generate binding, categorically binding duties to abide by the terms of the promise or the agreement. So, if you get married to someone and you say a bunch of vows in public that are about prioritizing that person ahead of all others, it's not just that doing your duty permits you to show favoritism to that person. Doing your duty demands that you show at least certain kinds of favoritism towards that person. Okay. So that's, that's the kind of the core bit of the deontologist reply to this objection. Where the action is, though, where, where Stocker's going to try to press, or someone who's sort of attracted to St Stocker's line of thought is going to press here, is all about 
how the motivation works. Are you being motivated towards, um, uh, in your expression of you know, partiality or prioritization towards the people you love, are you being motivated in a way that simultaneously subscribes to the demands of Kantian rationalism and also is appropriately grounded in concern for the person themselves rather than some abstract ideal? How can you keep both of those things in sight at the same time? So uh, someone who's like a, a fairly faithful follower of Kant, like Korsgaard, will want to say um, there is a way to get these two things right. The dutiful person has to be motivated in a way that's sort of grounded in the ideal of duty, but then the object of the motivation is not duty as such. The object of the motivation is the person themselves. So we're trying to prize apart two different dimensions of the motivation. One dimension of the motivation demonstrates its allegiance to Kantian rationalism. The other dimension of the motivation demonstrates an allegiance to the person themselves. Right, so you could put it something like this to say the motivation's source is duty, but its object is helping the person. What do people think? Does this sound viable, plausible, contemptible? Yeah, I think the Kantian would say something like, um, if all we're concerned about is demonstrating our allegiance to the rationalistic part of the, the, the framework, then that case looks good. But whether this is going to fully satisfy Stocker, it's, it's harder to say, right? Because remember, Stocker's going to take the perspective of the person who's on the receiving end of the kind action that's motivated by duty rather than motivated by concern for the person in themselves. He's going to say, in a case like that, the person in hospital um, might be, you know, prefer that they got a visit rather than no visit at all, but they're going to feel slight, somewhat slighted if they were to hear the full disclosure from the person who's visiting them that, yeah, well, the reason I came here tonight is because I take duty very seriously, right? <laughs> So, so I, if, if the duty can actually get the point of reference right, then maybe the, the person who's on the receiving end of the nice action is going to be satisfied. Right? So if what they say is, yeah, look, I'm motivated by duty. But understand, duty kind of contains you within it. You are part of my duty. I mean, you know, it, it might make them feel absolutely glowing inside, but it might be enough to kind of you know, hold off that sense that I'm just some random pawn in your ethics game, you know, but you, you can, like, it's kind of a subtle combination of attitudes that you have to get right. One, one kind of response that you would ha might have to this is to say that it's just not clear that you can keep these two elements apart as neatly as, you know, on this analysis, to say, okay, the motivation source is duty, but its object is people, but how do we keep the source of motivations and the object of motivations so neatly separated? It seems entirely natural to suppose that the object of the motivation is going to be permeated by its source, if that makes sense. So if it doesn't make sense, just think about someone you know who seems like a really dutiful person, whether you know, it's someone who subscribes to a particular set of religious doctrines that they take really seriously and obey, or maybe someone who in school was just kind of had that psychological mindset that they really wanted to be an obedient, well-behaved kid and always do what the teacher said. Think about a person who's like that, or if you don't know any people who are like that, imagine someone who's like that. When you see them do something nice, it's really hard to not be suspicious of the niceness, right? Even if they say, oh no, I was being nice to Joe because I really care about Joe. It's like, but I know you. I know that you're just like 
an inveterate do-gooder, that you just want to obey people <laughs> and, get, you know, and get the sense that you've, you've done the right thing. So even if you're telling me that your motivation has this person as its, ob as its object, it's hard to kind of let go of the suspicion that, it's, that the source of the motivation in the desire to be obedient and do your duty has kind of got in there and compromised that. So we're not going to, obviously it's going to be um, too tricky to settle this question. The, the one thing that I just also reiterate is that Williams's claim about one thought too many enters back in here as well. Even if you accept that there is some way to prize apart the source of the motivation and the object of the motivation, Williams might say, paying any attention to the source, right, is already a kind of mistake. The object of the motivation is the person themselves, and that's really, if you care about that person as a friend or a lover, that's really all there should be. And if that's right, then getting the motivations to hang together in a way that's going to satisfy the hardcore Kantian is not going to be possible. Okay, but that gives you a sense of how the Kantian is going to try to respond to this. The consequentialist probably has an even more difficult time in telling the sort of story they need to tell that's going to satisfy Stoker. So the person you have to think of here who's going to kind of be a living counterexample to Stoker's complaint about consequentialism is someone who is a really, really good friend, someone who is committed, empathetic, you know, totally capable of entering into the worldview of their, of their friend or lover and taking that seriously. You know, they, they've just, however you think of like the best way of having genuine solidarity with another person, this person exemplifies those virtues to a maximal degree. But then when you ask them, hey, so how's this all work? You seem like such a good friend. You seem like such a, such a good, you know, wife or husband or, um, you know, child. To you. you're, such a, you're such a good kid the way you relate to your parents. How, does it, how do you make sense of this all in a cool reflective moment? Imagine a person whose answer is a consequentialist answer. They say, look, I think life goes better when we let ourselves have these kind of ardent commitments to other people. Right? Consequentialism itself, on the surface level, looks like a, an impartial theory. But if we tried to live by the lights of that impartial theory and not have these kind of ardent parochial commitments, we'd all just get totally burned out. We couldn't cope. We're not wired that way. We need to have special connections with other people and sort of solidarity relations and people that we can rely on and that we know would take a bullet for us. And it's only possible to do that if we demonstrate these kinds of favoritisms. So that's what I do, but my justification for doing it is a consequentialist one. So Peter Railton, in an article that's replying to um, Michael Stocker, tries to defend this way of being a consequentialist. There is a kind of double-mindedness here, but Railton thinks it makes sense. So here he's speaking on behalf of the person who has deep relationships but who justifies them in consequentialist terms. So that person would say, I know that you can't always put family first, the world isn't such a wonderful place that it's okay just to retreat into your own little circle. But still, you need that little circle. People get burned out or lose touch if they try to save the world by themselves. Right? So, if you've read the Stocker article, you know what he's going to say. He's going to say, this looks like precisely the kind of schizophrenic mindset that I was trying to criticise. You've got a different story that you tell when you're trying to justify your actions from the motivational content of your actions day to day. Day to day, you're just going around loving people and caring about people and showing them special favour. When you're called upon to justify it, you tell a different story about what's going on and those two stories are in tension with each other. But what Railton's going to say is the kind of tension you're describing is unavoidable. It's completely sustainable. We see people who live their lives with these kinds of mismatches between what motivates them day to day and what justifies them in those motivations. And moreover, it's unavoidable, it's sustainable, and it's meritorious. It's good, right? We get something like the best of both worlds. We get a consequentialist kind of world where we're all trying to make things better in the long run, which is good, but that world doesn't come at the expense of having genuine, ardent, genuine, ardent relationships. Okay, so now I've given you a sketch of how the deontologist and the consequentialist are both going to reply to this. And coming back to our example before, the guy can now say what he should have said all along, which is, I'm visiting you, I'm bringing you flowers because I care, because I love you. 
and, um, and his partner's going to say, great, that's all I wanted to hear. <laughs> Was it that hard? Why didn't you say that the first time? But there's a lingering worry, right? The stories that we've told now are stories which show how within a consequentialist framework or within a, within a deontological framework, you can be permitted to show special favour and special concern to other people, right? They've shown how it's possible for this guy, even while he is a consequentialist, or even while he is a deontologist, to show up to the hospital to say, I'm visiting because I care, and to be telling the truth, right? All of that is now demonstrated, well, if, if you buy the arguments, what we've shown is that that's possible. But it still is conditioned by the recognition that morality takes priority. So, if the circumstances were different, and if this guy therefore had concluded that morally speaking he ought to do otherwise, I wouldn't have come. You know, so his first statement, I'm visiting because I care, should have brackets after it, but only because morality permits me to care in this particular case, and if it didn't, I wouldn't. Right? It seems like any attempt to tell a story about how special partiality uh, special favouritism is consistent with an impartial ethical theory is going to have some kind of residue where the two things don't perfectly align and when they don't perfectly align, which takes priority? Right? If ethics takes priority, even just in a counterfactual way, then what Stock is going to say is we're liable to feel some sort of deficit in the, in the richness, integrity of the relationship. On the other hand, if the relationship takes priority, then what? Ethics just gets subordinated. Ethics becomes do the right thing unless you're special friends with someone and that you'd prefer to show priority to them rather than doing the right thing. Now it seems like the whole domain of ethics has been compromised. So can we get both of the things we want? Susan Wolfe takes that second option. She says, look, let's just concede that ethics ain't everything. There are certain kinds of sources of reason, sources of value in human life where the reasons and the values aren't ethical values. And it's at least sometimes appropriate to, to be guided by or responsive to those outside sources of value. Ethics is a source of reason, but it's not an ultimate and always overriding source of reason. So just to kind of set things up here, we, we can talk about different kinds of reasons in the following way. Moral reasons determine what you morally ought to do. For example, morally speaking, you ought not to gratuitously hurt another person's feelings. Prudential reasons determine what you prudentially ought to do. For instance, prudentially it might make sense to tell a white lie to get out of trouble. We can think of lots of other kinds of reasons, right? You could talk about artistic reasons. Artistically speaking, you ought to hold yourself up in a bunker with, you know, like a bunch of acid and canned beans and some recording equipment and make great music. But all things considered, should you do that? Well, that's a further question, right? Relationally speaking, you should treat your partner as a demigod and prioritise them above all other people. But all things considered speaking, is that what you should, you should do? Well, you know, that's a further question. Athletically speaking, you should spend four hours a day in the gymnasium turning yourself into, you know, Chris Hemsworth or whatever. But all things considered, is that what you should do? Well, it's a further question. And then the question is, where our moral reasons butt heads with other kinds of reasons, like prudential reasons, or reasons of artistic or aesthetic origins, or reasons that are to do with the kinds of relationships we have, what should take priority? And notice that the question can't be, morally speaking, what ought we to do when these two kinds of reasons conflict? Because if we think that the question is, morally speaking, what ought you to do, then we've already begged the question in favour of morality. We've already said that the moral reasons are the ultimate, fundamental, axiomatic reasons. The quest, but the question we're trying to ask is, is one that treats that as something that's yet to be resolved. Do the moral reasons automatically trump the other kinds of reasons, or can these other kinds of reasons get involved and override? What Wolf is wanting to do in this article, Moral Saints, is challenge a view that we call moral imperialism, which is just the view that the moral reasons always take priority and precedence. The main way the argument works in this paper is to say that if moral imperialism is right, if the moral reasons always take priority over the other reasons, then we should all aim to be moral saints. 
which just means we should aim to be people whose every action and every choice is like maximally good. And she thinks that that seems really dubious. So, and it, I mean, the, the intuition that she's trying to elicit here is not zeroed in on a particular case. If you have a particular case and someone says, um, you know, morally speaking, you ought to do X, but if you're paying attention to kind of considerations that are to do with artistic and creativity concerns, then you ought to do Y. When we just think about the case in isolation, someone who chose to do Y, we might say, well, whatever, fair enough, you know, I guess you had your reasons, but you really ought to have done X. Morally speaking, that's what you ought to have done. When we think about cases in isolation, it's hard to let go of the idea that moral reasons trump other kinds of reasons. But then when we zoom out and think about the kind of world that we would be living in, if everyone allowed moral reasons to trump other kinds of reasons all the time, it would be a world full of moral saints. And what Wolf is trying to get us to think is that in some sense or other, that's a world that we should be less eager to live in. Not morally speaking less eager, of course, because morally speaking, a world of moral saints would be the best world. But that there's some outside source of reasons and values which morality can't contain that should make us feel anxious or uneasy about a world full of moral saints. Maybe it's aesthetic values. Maybe it's values to do with just how kind of interesting and exciting and exotic relationships can be. Now, you might notice superficially there's a resemblance here between what Wolf is saying and what Williams was saying in the stuff about integrity a few weeks ago. Williams had these examples of George and Jim, people who wound up in unfortunate situations where it seemed like in order to promote the best consequences they had to do something that really went against their own values like work for a chemical weapons company or um, kill someone to save some other people. And Williams was trying to say, look, consequentialism is bad because it can't contain these considerations to do with integrity. But there you can see the difference between what Williams is doing and what Wolf is doing. The upshot of Williams' complaint was supposed to be that because consequentialism can't make sense of certain important ethical concerns, that shows that it's a bad ethical theory. A good ethical theory, a comprehensive ethical theory, would be able to fold in these additional concerns about integrity. That's not what Wolf is saying. Wolf isn't arguing that we should try to expand our ethical theory to incorporate all the other sources of reasons that are out there. What she's saying is, no, just accept that ethical demands are this kind of restricted set of demands that cover a certain set of you know, issues and considerations and allow that there are other considerations out of, outside of that and sometimes those other considerations are just as important as the ethical ones or more important. Okay, here's a quote from the article which I think puts a fine point on this in a really interesting way. She says, a moral saint will have to be very, very nice. And I just love that she says that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> it is important that he not be offensive. The worry is that as a result, he will have to be dull-witted or humorless or bland. It's like she's saying a world of moral saints is boring, right? It's not sexy. It's not cool. It's not exciting. Something gets lost in the, in the impulse to let morality be the sovereign and total source of reasons in our lives. Now, when you try to be precise about this and say, all right, if morality is going to be put on the, have its neck on the block, what should, what should override? Are you saying that actually it's more important that people are allowed to be offensive than that justice should happen? Is that the claim? Is humour more important than, you know, is allowing humour more important than eliminating suffering? What's, what's the actual claim? It's pretty hard for Wolf or someone with her view to, to give us an answer that's going to be fully satisfactory. Indeed, it's hard to know what kind of arguments or evidence she could appeal to in order to persuade someone who doesn't share her initial intuition about the case. So what, the way Wolf's argument is really working is, say, imagine a world of moral saints. Don't you find it boring? And don't you think, therefore, I mean, that's being a bit unfair to her. Don't you find it kind of incomplete and lacking in something? And therefore, can't you see that morality shouldn't trump all else? You can imagine a person having the reply to say, well, yeah, maybe it would be lacking in something, but... To my mind, it seems like a sensible trade-off. If like a world of moral saints is a world without all the bad suffering, yeah, it might be a bit boring, but that's a better world. And it's not clear that she's really got anything in the tank to, to trot out here to persuade a person who's not persuaded by the initial kind of aesthetic disparity between the two cases. Um, I'm going to skip that middle point and just talk about the last one. 
Um, the other thing to bear in mind here is that Wolf uh, is really trying to. Uh, why is she, you know, going in this direction? It's not that she's an ethical anti-realist. She is an ethical realist. She just thinks that the, you know, objectively demanding reasons of ethics don't trump all of the other sources of reason. So as an ethical realist, she's still got as many items on her theoretical to-do list as the consequentialists and the deontologists, right? She still has to give us an account of right action, an account of duty, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in addition to all of that, she's also got to tell some story about how the ethical demands interact with the extra ethical demands, as in the, the, the outside of ethical demands. Right? So she's got to do all the theoretical work that her rivals have to do and another bit more. And that extra bit more that she has to do is really, really complicated because she's going to have to tell us a story about, all right, if humour matters, when do the considerations to do with humour interact with and override the considerations to do with being a good person? And all of this theoretical labour has been put on the to-do list in order to, you know, address a fairly nebulous anxiety about the way that you know, being a thoroughgoing moral theorist potentially alienates you from your, your relationships. You might think that the easiest response to that problem is to s just bite that bullet and say, yeah, alienation is a part of the ethical life. Right? And that's not perfect, but it's a less theoretically problematic response than trying to build, build a kind of an ethical realist theory that at the same time allows that considerations from outside of ethics get some grip on our actions. Now... I want to link this back to some bigger picture themes from the course in the next five minutes. We started out in the middle of this course, and occasionally I've been revisiting it, just asking this big top-level question, is ethical realism a defensible position? The first five weeks of the semester were spent asking meta-ethical questions that linked to that quite directly. The last few weeks we've been looking at different normative ethical theories. How does examining normative ethical theories speak to the question of whether ethical realism is defensible? Well, remember the thought was something like this. If our ethical judgments seem completely random and arbitrary and disorderly, then they look a lot like arbitrary cultural conventions. And now, the, the ethical realist looks like they're in a lot of trouble. Because if the content of the ethical claims that they're endorsing just to all intents and purposes seem like arbitrary cultural conventions, the idea that that's grounded in something objective and time independent and universal looks really implausible. So coming up with a normative ethical theory is supposed to support the view that there really is some objective, universal, principled set of standards here that are deciding why we say these actions are right and these actions are wrong. Right? It's supposed to support the ethical realist by supporting the, at least the appearance that the content of our ethical judgments is the kind of thing that could be part of a universal, timeless set of truths. But what we found in trying to um, build up an ethical theory and subject the, the theories to criticism is that there are so many angles from which we can criticise what we're building. Ethical thought is, as I say here, staggeringly complex. And to be clear, I'm not just saying that ethical thought becomes staggeringly complex when we try to do philosophy around it. It's complex before we even start philosophizing. Just having kind of uh, untutored everyday ethical convictions and attitudes has implications for how we think about all of these things. Value, motivation, responsibility, whether it's praise or, praise or blame or punishment. What else have I got on the list? Integrity, psychological stability, coherence, duty, rationality. There are all these different conceptual dimensions of ethical thought. Any theory is that's going to try to capture all of our ethical intuitions and be adequate and usable and actionable for creatures like us is going to have to have something to say about all of these issues and the likelihood that it's going to have a perfectly satisfying thing to say about all of these issues obviously it's, it's a, a tall ask. So one kind of response to this is to do what Wolf is doing and to say look I'm just going to give up from the outset on the idea that ethical theorising can capture everything that we care about everything that feels like it's involved in the ethical life. I'm going to treat ethics a little bit like what you might call mega-etiquette, right? So etiquette is about buying into a, sort of a certain reductive set of conventions about how we behave at the dinner table and when we're greeting people and saying goodbye to them. I'm going to think of ethics as a, like an expanded version of that. Ethics governs a certain subset of our interactions with other people and sets standards for what we should do in those interactions with them, but it doesn't contain and absorb the totality of the reasons that have a grip on our lives. Now, 
if you don't like that response, but you share this anxiety that we want ethical theory to kind of contain all of the complexity, and it's hard to see how any reductive ethical theory like de deontology or consequentialism can do this, the option that remains available to you is virtue ethics. Virtue ethics, which we're going to talk about next week, is a different kind of ethical theory, because instead of trying to reduce down ethics to some uh, like core thing like rationality or duty or the good, rather it reduces it down to a concept, virtue, which then immediately springs off in a plurality of directions. Because what virtues are, are the character traits or dispositions that you need to live a flourishing human life. And all of the complexity that's involved in a flourishing human life is now on the table within a virtue ethical framework. And it contains these dimensions that are to do with relationships, to do with aesthetic values, to do with, you know, um, intellectual values, and of course all the ones to do with the, the kind of day-to-day -day interpersonal and political considerations that ethics, the kind of ethics we've been looking at is primarily concerned with. So virtue ethics is a, if you like, an ethical theory that's expressly geared to capture as much of that complexity as possible. The downside is it has a really hard time actually spitting out answers about how we should respond to specific moral quandaries. Virtue ethics puts much more attention on trying to capture the complexity and less attention on trying to give us a precise, neat, actionable theory of right and wrong action. So we'll talk about that next week and that will be the last lecture for the semester. I look forward to seeing you all then.